Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and get yourselves back together because we want to cover a couple more things, give you some more help on some structural things that you may be running into, as well as talk a little bit about sort of uh, mechanical systems design and how you have to start thinking about modeling that stuff too. Just to equip you with all the good things you need, to, you need to get all these assignments completed. So for this next section, what we're actually going to do is let's go ahead and, especially with the structural ones, since I'll, I'll kind of walk through some structural stuff, but please, let let this one be very interactive based on sort of the things you're running into as you're trying to model your structures because I think you're already sort of well into it. You're probably running into some, some very specific problems and cases that you uh, would like to have addressed. But for this, what I'm going to do is actually close out of Revit architecture and I'm just going to open up Revit structure instead. So let me go ahead. I'm going to just open up on my machine Revit structure. If you want to follow along, please do. We'll say Autodesk uh, Revit Structure 2012. And again, the tool is really essentially the same. It's the same engine, works with all the same model elements and stuff like that. It's really just up in the ribbon in terms of the tools that are available to you where the differences start to appear. Where in Revit Structure, there are some new tabs that are available that aren't available in architecture for applying things like loads and boundary conditions and things that are useful for analysis. But fundamentally, it's still pretty much the same thing under the covers. Let's see what's going on here in terms of it coming up. You can close out those uh, Word documents. Uh, or is let me just going to close some of those. This machine is just very slow sometimes. It's like it's doing one too many things. Hey, let me try getting rid of the structure again. Maybe I missed. Hmm. It's thinking. Exactly. What it's thinking, I don't know. It's probably not good things about me. <laughs> Oh, we're trying to open up Revit structure. It's just thinking. This, uh, this country is a little bit slow these days. They are replacing this country. Okay. Yeah, it is. There it comes. Let's go and open up Revit structure. And you can open up your structural model if you want. But really, what I want to look at is, again, sort of the basic flow for putting the structure in, but then start talking about there's some interesting variations that you run into. Uh, all sorts of custom shapes and sizes and trusses and things that aren't just sort of the straightforward just beams and columns. And you want to start thinking about how to model those things accurately too, and how those can actually help you out quite a bit. Like in your building, let's just kind of think about as this is opening up some of the variations. For the most part, is the building that you're modeling all steel? Or is there a mixture of steel and concrete? Tell me a little bit about your building and how the structure is actually set up. Steel needs to concrete on metal deck. Okay, so lightweight concrete on a metal deck? Yes. Got it. Is all that steel, is it very standard, like wide flange sections and tube steel and kind of very standard things? So it's just wide, wide flange. Very good. Is there anything unusual, curved steel yeah, or tapering steel, or what's going on? There's a truss like barrel block truss. Okay. At the, the atrium. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's actually a true truss in terms of like the shape. Yeah. And that. Okay, we can take a look at that. In terms of doing something like that, what's going on here? No, I do not want to debug the web page. I'll say no thanks. I don't want to participate in the customer improvement program today. Why not? Well, because it tracks my keystrokes, and I'm not sure I want that. Oh, it looks like I even have two of them open right now. See, that's, that's the problem with being in, uh, uh, impatient, is you end up with two copies of it open. So let's see if we can do this. I'm going to look at Revit structure right now. That's very bad looking right there. Oh, I see. And we'll open up a new one. That's not very new. That's I clicked on something, but I'm going to open up a new project file.
Very good. So I got a blank project right now, but we'll use this for the purpose of sort of illustrating what's going on. You can have your own project open if you want to, but open up a Revit project so we can start looking at this. And where we started last time, and probably with some of those critical stuff for everyone to get going as you're doing structures, it's just the whole idea of levels and grids. You got to get your levels and grids set up the way you want them to kind of do this building. So to illustrate what we're doing today, let me go ahead. I'm going to set up a couple of different levels and grid systems. If you already have some levels and grids in your building, you don't have to kind of mirror exactly what I'm doing, but I just want to sort of illustrate some things. What I want to do is sort of build a little steel structure and a little concrete structure side by side so we can talk about the differences between them and kind of think about the variations. So what I'll do, and again, don't worry if you're not following along with this exactly, you can go ahead and uh, just kind of start adding the columns and the beams to them. I'm just going to grab some grids. And I'm just going to put down a few oh, horizontal grids. Uh, again, sort of put one across like this. That'll be grid line number one. I can put down grid line number two, grid line number three. Again, my favorite trick for grids is to go through and choose the grid tool and use the pick line tool to offset grids as opposed to sort of drawing them all one at a time because I think that just sort of saves a lot of time in terms of doing it that way. So I'll put in an offset distance. Then I'll go through and put some grids in, in the other direction. For the other direction, I'll draw the first one. Oops, I still have that offset turned on. Let me do that again. With the offset turned off, down to zero now, I'll draw one like this. The big thing is, when you start writing the grids in the other direction, go ahead and give yourself a different naming convention, like the alphabetic conventions, something like that. And we can say home, I'll go back to the grids again, and I'll start offsetting those also. Maybe say 25 in that direction. And notice that the naming convention gets picked up. So it'll always take the last thing, and now I've got some nice just rectangular grids that we're going to use to put some uh, steel on in just a second. So that's just going to get us started on the one side. You probably, most of you have things like that set up in your buildings already? Some grid lines? Okay, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to right next door here go through and do another grid system, though. Just to kind of be a little bit different. This one I'm going to do the grids, but instead of using uh, kind of the straight grids, I'm going to illustrate the whole notion of using the uh, arced grids instead, because we have a lot of curvaceous structures these days, things that follow uh, kind of curves, and it's nice if we want to go through and model those. To also put in a grid system that is, what I'm going to do is put in just grids here, here, and sort of pull out an arc. Maybe that thing over on the left is going to be my building. This is going to be a nice arcade out front or something like that. Just something a little bit different, a little architectural feature. Okay, I can go through and give it its own naming scheme. I can call it D. Yeah, D is not too bad. I can call it something else if I want to. For the second grid line, how about this? If you want to have arcs where they're all sort of following the same center point, Okay, the easiest way to do it is actually to go through and use the offset tool because the offset tool will then spread those two different arcs out kind of the same even distance. So they'll follow. Okay, and I can sort of set up grids that way. So that's pretty good in terms of doing the arc grids. Now the other way is a little bit harder. You know, I'd sort of like to have a radial grid too that comes back towards the center. And that's a little bit tricky, but let's show you how you can do that. It's a little kind of odd, but let's see if we can make it work. Here's the deal. The hardest part about working with arcs like this is figuring out where is the center point of the arc, because it's not really clear where it is. You can find it, and sometimes to find it, you need to do a little bit of a little construction geometry to kind of see where things are. But let me show you a trick that I use for doing something like that. Sometimes, every once in a while, I will go to the Annotate tab and just use detail lines just really as construction lines. It's just little things to help me locate some geometry, where if I take a detail line, and if I pull away from the arcs, when I get to just perpendicular, can you see that the uh, cursor is actually changing to show the little perpendicular symbol? Okay. That means that I now have a line that's perpendicular to that. Okay. Let me go ahead and do a perpendicular in the other direction. I'll draw another line that's over here that is, again, perpendicular. And where those two things intersect is not only perpendicular, but you, it's hard to see. There's actually a little circle there. That's actually the center point of those things. And I'm just using that really to figure out where the radius is. That's just sort of basic geometry stuff. And the reason I'm doing that is now what I want to do is go through and put some grids in the other direction. 
My radial grids can look like, oh, I'll just come along this line. Then what I'll do is, if I would like to array those grids around, sort of have them around so they're all following that same sort of uh, radius, what I can do is choose the grid, and I'll use the array tool. Now the array tool lets us either do linear or radial arrays. I'll choose radial because I want to have something that's coming around a center point. And here's the trick to doing this. I need to move the center point of the array down to that intersection. Okay, because then they'll all radiate around that point. Okay, and now I can go back and sort of swing an arc between here and just wherever I want that to be. I can say how many of those instances I want in there, three, four, or five. Let me put five instances in there. Oops, I actually did something goofy there. I had, I swung the distance to the second one and then put in five, so it kept on going around. And what I really want to do is say that's the distance to the last one. So, oops, my mistake. Let's go ahead and fix that. Again, well here, we'll do the radial array. I'm going to just pop it right down here. Let me say last in the options bar. Choose that. Swing it on over. Okay, and now I'll put the five in there. And I get some nice, evenly located uh, grid lines to work with. Okay, so that's kind of a quickie way of doing radial grids. Yes? I have a question. If you use the array for levels, is it going to create prime views also? Um, if you, will it create the plan views? Yes. I think it will automatically. When you draw a level, I think it automatically creates a plan view. If it doesn't, Okay, you could always go back in and add or take out the levels. If you want to take out a level, just come over here and delete it. Or it won't actually take out the level, it'll just take out the plan view associated with that level. In the same sort of sense, if you want to grab and have new plan views for a level, under the View tab, go to Plan Views, and you can choose whether it's a ceiling plan or a floor plan. And then you can uh, choose the different levels you want to create them for. So I know there's different variations. I think when you draw them, it does create them. I'm not sure. I think even when we're doing the offsetting, let me even try that. Exactly. I think you're onto sort of a good issue there. Let's try this out. Under level, okay, watch out for that dialog right there. That's the, the, that option right there. It's whether it makes a new plan view or not. So you can create levels without plan views, or you can, and it's, I think it's turned on by default. But you may be right. Maybe copying doesn't actually go through and do it. So if I do a copy, yep, it doesn't automatically create them that way. It's very interesting. Whereas if I draw, it does. So now I have two without four. So again, to fix that, what I would do is go to View, Plan Views, and I'd say, yes, make one for three also, and add it into the list. Yeah, very good question. It's, it's interesting. Same sort of thing happens. I don't know if you've noticed it yet. But if you're putting in doors and windows, if you put doors and windows in, in a floor plan view, they get tagged. If you put them in, in a 3D view, they don't get tagged. You can add the tags in later, but it's a little bit different based upon which view you place things and the, the mechanism you do. Okay. Anyway, we got some grid, grids to work with. Let's go ahead and just using some of the stuff we learned last time, go through and put some basic columns and uh, things on these grids. And the grid lines actually make it fairly easy to do. Ooh, live maintenance patch. Not today. Uh, let's go back to the Home tab. What I'm going to do is choose the Column tool, and we'll just put some kind of straight columns in there right now. There's this choice over here whether columns are vertical or slanted. Let's put some vertical ones in first. We'll choose vertical columns. We can choose a wide flange section because this is the steel part that I want to put in here now. So choose anything you want. I'll just put some big old steel columns in there. I'll say At Grids. And now I can put them in there. And by putting them in there, I can either select things one at a time by control, 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 and collecting all those. So now I should have a column at each of those different intersections. You can sort of see the little uh, suggestion of where it'll be right there. Actually, I should have paid attention to Let me cancel out of this before I get going. I'll get going too fast and I sort of forget to do important things like pay attention to these columns you know, where are we placing them? And I'm on level three, so I'm putting them on level three. Let me put them on down on level one instead for now, because we'll copy them up to level three in a minute. I'm going to put them at level three, at level one instead, uh, beams, pardon me, columns. There you are. 
I can decide whether they're going to go down from level one or up from level one. I'm going to put them going up from level one up to level two as a starting point right now. Okay, and now we'll do this grid thing. So always try to get the uh, parameters set up first. Actually, a real quick thing we can do here is just if we just do a drag across all those, okay, it'll sort of uh, indicate it'll select all the grids and kind of put them in all those locations. So I can say finish. And I should have a nice field of columns floating around in my 3D view. Excellent. Okay, let's go ahead and take care of that round section too. I'll go back to level one. For the round section, what I want to do is actually I'm going to put in some uh, just uh, concrete columns instead. I'll go to columns. You'll see that I don't have any concrete columns. Actually, I do. I have some rectangular ones. I don't want rectangular ones. I'm going to put in some round columns because I like this uh, round columns in my trellis. So what I will do is whenever you have a shape that you need that you don't have, you can say load the family. We can go out to the library and in our structural, you'll find different types like columns, concrete. Then I'll find, oh, kind of square columns that have a kind of a capital on them, rectangular columns, round columns of the capital. I'm just going to go for those plain round columns. but. Know that there are a lot of column types out there, and you can sort of load any family you want to to kind of create the different types that you need. So I can once again choose by grids or just place them individually. 12 inches is kind of wimpy. Let's go for something a little bigger like a 24 inch column. Okay, and again I can place them individually, or if I do by grids, let me just grab all those grids and place them. Okay, so now I have a nice field of the round columns too. Now I just want to have those two different materials there because actually as we start placing beams, we're going to start be treating concrete and steel a little bit differently relative to each other. Yes? Yes. It'll, it'll rotate them to follow the grid, so yeah. either across or this way, but it will radially rotate them relative to the intersection. Yeah. yeah, it's actually pretty cool. So, good question. That's actually, yes, that's fun to sort of see. Okay, now straight columns are kind of cool when you have columns that are going vertically, but you're going to find that these days we actually have an awful lot of architecture that has columns that are canting and sloping and doing funny things to them. And you can place those in sort of a very similar way, but let's talk about how you do that. The option for slanted columns is really right next door here, slanted columns. And if instead of choosing vertical column, we choose that, let's just take a look at what the options say. Okay, what we're going to do is basically place two different clicks. And for those two different clicks, what we're going to do is sort of say for the first click, what level will it be on? For the second click, what level will it be on? Okay, so. If I wanted to have a column that was slanting and going between level one and level two, I would say from level one at zero up to level two, it's complaining to me now because it's sort of at the same level. Let me separate it first. It won't let me get to sort of a nonsensible state between there. Okay, level one at zero to level two at zero. It'll like that. And first click will be the base of the column. Second click will be the location of the top of the column. Okay, and let's take a look at that in 3D and show you what it actually looks like. So here it is. It's kind of hanging around over there. It's kind of sloping relative to everything else. Now this little sloping column is really, well, it's not exactly what I have in mind, but it's kind of close there. Different things about this column. You'll notice that in terms of the column ends, it's always sort of put in the ends kind of perpendicular to the axis of the column, the main line. Okay, you can go to control that, because typically that's not what you want. If you choose a slanted column, you can control the end conditions. The column style is, oh, move top width, hang on, I'm going to sort of move this around over here so I can sort of see better. Base cut style, perpendicular. If you would like it to be horizontal, you can make that horizontal and it'll sort of slice it off that way. The other variation is if you want to make the top vertical or horizontal, really whatever it is that your architectural needs are, you can kind of control those things. So just know about that. Slanted columns are really pretty easy to work with in terms of what you need. In fact, you can even sort of use slanted columns to go through and create oh, little mini trusses or like little diagrids and stuff like that. 
And how you can do that is if you take a column and do a slanted column, let me just do this as 3D snapping as opposed to placing it in floor plan view. But I can come on in here and say that, you know, what I would really like to do is have a column really from the base of this one to the top of that one. And I'd like to have it from the top of this one to the base of that one. Maybe from the top of that one to the base of that one. But it's quite easy to go through and create these like sort of structural members that slope around there. And all it really is is it's a profile. It's a round profile that's just real following a path. And we're just snapping between those different paths. So slanted columns are one of those things that are available to you. And again, you can change the size, whatever it is you need to do. And kind of start making all sorts of interesting sort of structural shapes that way. So one variation on this theme is kind of columns and things that sort of slant and change and all that type of stuff. Okay. Another variation on this theme, though, that you want to know about is, well, now let me show you, show you some beams, then we'll show you them both together, how we can start, start creating some uh, um, unique elements. Let me go ahead and just put some beams in here. We did this last time, so I won't spend a lot of time doing it, but we're over there on that side. When it's time to go through and place beams, if I want to put some steel beams in, I'll choose the type. And I'll just choose some big ones. Again, I'm not going to worry about the size too much because... We're going to have the structural engineer size those up later using an analysis program, and we can change the model from the analysis program. I can again do this in 3D if I want to, but for steel, the big important thing to keep in mind is this whole issue of the justification. When we're placing steel, we tend to place steel not at the floor level. We actually put it below the floor level because you want it below the metal decking underneath the concrete. And in Revit, by default, that assembly they give is five inches, so three inches of concrete and two inches of decking. Yours may be a little bit different, but you have to go through and just really make sure that it's at the appropriate level because the beams don't penetrate the decking. They sort of ride underneath it. So how I put that in there is, again, I change the Z justification, and I'll just put in there minus five inches. And now I can start clicking over here. I, get, I like to do 3D snapping just because it's easy for me. Pop in there to kind of see what's going on. And you'll see that beam is actually down a little bit lower. Now, in your structure, actually I should ask this because you've sort of been looking at your plans. Yeah. Do you have any detail about the columns and how they break? Do they break right at the floor level or do they break actually above the floor level a little bit? At the floor level? That's interesting, because a lot of times they don't. It just kind of depends on what the construction sequence is going to be. And this is going to get to the point of you want to model the way it's going to be built. So if they're going to build it with a break at the floor level, you should model it that way. And a lot of times what will happen is we'll put columns in that actually break a few feet above the floor level and have the joint really in the middle of the floor level. And they do that really mostly from the ease of construction thing, because when it's up there, it's a less complicated joint. You have plates that are easy to bolt when they're a few feet off the floor. You also need to think about, are the columns single level at a time? Or a lot of times now we'll fabricate things in two-story sections or three-story sections and crane them in. It won't be a 10-story section, but you want us to go ahead and model things in a section that's going to mirror the way that it's actually going to be brought out to the site. So we can treat it as a single element that way. So we'll put those beams in there, and they're looking pretty good. Okay, final thing on our little steel structure over here was... We put in some beam systems. The beam systems, again, were the joists, like the lightweight joists, because the big steel beams, they're not going to be able, or the floor decking won't be able to span 20 feet or 25 feet. We want to have some intermediate joists. So to do that, what we did last time was we came in here and we chose a beam system. We could choose the type, whether it's a wide flange, or last time I brought in some smaller things. I'll just bring in some small beams, some little wide flange ones. We'll come over here. Again, we have the issue of the elevation. So relative to the place we're putting this, you know, we also want to have the beam system dropped too. Yes? They have the columns at the floor level, but they have offset the beams a little lower. Yes. So I think that is that sort of it is over the beam, like it's not on the floor. So so they do poke up a little bit above the beams, kinda of like this? Yeah. Beautiful. That's kind of a that's a common technique. Yeah. Good. So to pay attention to that stuff because you always want to make sure your modeling sort of is an accurate reflection. Because really as we keep on going, you know, when we start doing construction planning and sequencing and simulations, we want to model that's accurately going to reflect the how things will be brought out to site. Fantastic.
It's, it's nice to hear that's actually working the way you sort of expect it to. That's good. Okay, for drawing these things, again, I could draw the boundaries, but what I tend to do is actually pick the beams they're going to rest on. And the trick here was that whichever one you pick first is going to determine the direction of the beam system. We could change it if we want to, but I'll just choose it going in this direction. It's drawing my pink lines at the bottom, but when I say OK, Actually, I take that back. It says the work plane is level one. My mistake in terms of what's going on. Let me kind of cancel all of this because that's not what I want to do. Because if I put them down, they're actually going to put them down at level one. It's the danger of doing things in 3D. Unless you're 3D snapping, there's sort of this ambiguity about what your work plane is right now. Let me cancel this. Sure you want to discard? Yes. Okay. If I want to do this in 3D like I've been doing it, what I should do is actually set the work plane and set it at level two instead. Okay. That way, even though I'm working in 3D, sort of doing a 2D operation, it'll show up there. In fact, I could show the work plan if you want to, and you sort of get a sense of where it is. Okay, so let's do that beam system again. The minus 5 inches. Minus 5 feet. That's not very good. Okay, and we'll figure out it's going to be these small wide flange sections. I'll just put them in at that distance for now. There, that's looking a little better. It looks like they're up at the top where they want to be. Say OK, and I'll finish that. Okay, and the nice thing about beam systems is, as a system, as opposed to placing these individually, it's although it's a little hard to select, if you hover and tab, you can select the individual elements or select the entire system. There's the system. And then when I have that system, I can do things like change the spacing just as a unit and it'll take care of all those things simultaneously. So that's kind of nice. So very good. You know, if you do beam systems and I decide later on that I want to run some open web joist so I can stick the duct work through them or something like that. Actually, how is yours? Do you have big beams? What are the smaller joists on your system? Smaller joists, like 20 KSV and... Oh, like the little K sections? Yeah. Oh, great. Hey, then why not load it in there so we can sort of see those? So again, what I'll do is I'll say beams, I'll load a family, we'll go to structural. We might as well do your structure as opposed to some arbitrary structure. Framing, steel, and there's the K-series bar joists. Let's do the ones that are the rods. We'll load in the sizes we want. So 20 is the depth and K3 is some sort of uh, thickness or some strength to them. And this is where I actually sort of really love the BIM modeling, is when we can go through and although we've placed all these elements, we have the wrong elements there, then we can select that whole system and just really by changing one choice right here to 20K3, get everything to pop out. And actually, let me warn you about this a little bit. Check out over here. See on our little structure? See how um, like the, the angle rods on the K-joists are actually looking very wimpy right now. Just like simple lines. And that's just an abstraction because we're looking at sort of a relatively coarse level of detail. Let me turn it up to fine. Can okay, it'll actually be true dimensional like rods in there. This is this issue of depending upon what you need, you know, it takes more time to render those little rods. So if you don't, don't really care about seeing the rods, leave it at medium or low, and it'll look sort of very abstract, but it'll be fine, you'll understand what's going on. Only bother turning up the level of detail if you need that. Okay, and it's really, you know, for an analytical view, I probably don't need that level of detail. If I was rendering it, I would want that level of detail. So great, I got this little structure here. That's looking fine. What I could do, given that I have that, is I went up to level two so I could look down on it. I can choose those, and let me go ahead and choose the joists. Not the girders, not the columns, but I'll get the beam system. I got those guys, and now I can do some copying if I want to. And I can do some copying if I want to and kind of copy that around. But the big thing was, you know, once you figured out what's going on in a single bay, copy where you can. We're ultimately going to copy and paste the line up to other levels so that we can kind of build the whole structure. But it can be pretty quick doing that stuff. Okay, let's come back over here and look at our little uh, kind of other side of the world. Over here, what I'd like to do is actually go through and place some beams in here. Okay, Maybe I'm going to put some concrete beams in there. So I'll choose 
Oh, some sort of beam system. Let's choose not the K joist. Do I have any sort of, yeah, some nice concrete beams. If I go through and I place these, and let me do it in 3D. I like to always place these in 3D. I don't know why. And I snap from the top of this one to the top of that one. You know, something happens that's not quite right, or maybe quite right. Really kind of depends on how you look at it. Oh, let me stop there for just a second. Concrete beams. Do concrete beams need to be set down, or can they actually ride at the floor level? What's that? Oh, for the concrete beams, do we need to sort of lower them the same way we did as the uh, steel beams, or can we actually just leave them at the floor level? Exactly. You can just leave them right actually at the floor level. And the reason is, when we put the concrete slab in there, they're going to magically meld together and it'll take care of all the materials, quantities, and stuff like that. So that's actually one of the big differences between steel and concrete structures, is that when we're talking about concrete beams, they tend to actually be measured relative to the floor level, because even though they intersect with the slab, you're getting the full effective depth of the concrete, even though part of it's also being used as a slab. Okay, so that's one of the small differences you sort of see between those things. So again, we'll put a beam in here. Let's go ahead and put a, another beam in. Concrete beam, that's fine. I'll do my 3D snapping. I'll set that as zero. Come back over here. Come over there. Now you will notice as I'm putting these in, although I'm sort of following a curve, I'm not exactly following a curve. It's making straight segments between them. And typically that's what we do. Even for a big old long arcing structure, we tend to put steel in there in straight segments, concrete there in straight segments, because it's, it's just a lot easier to manufacture and cheaper to get things that are straight segments and approximate big curves, as opposed to going through and actually making curved elements. But the way architects do things these days, every once in a while, you actually need to come up with a curved piece of steel, like for your barrel vault or for some sort of interesting architectural feature. And with all these kind of groovy, curvaceous roofs that are doing all sorts of undulations and stuff like that, often we need to sort of start making custom pieces. Now, there's a real dialogue that has to go on because making all these custom pieces is a very expensive thing to do. So your construction manager or your owner, you know, there's a cost to making custom pieces, but you can do it. So let's just kind of show you how you can. So if you need to do that, you understand how you can model it. Okay, we can do these sort of custom pieces either in floor plan views or in sort of elevation views. It really just depends what you need. If, for example, I want a curving beam, let me show you how you would make that. Okay, and it's really an instance of making a custom element. Okay, so we have all the standard elements. They're hanging around in the library kind of with standard straight shapes. They're really actually, if you think about how they're defined, they're profiles that are extruded along a path. That's really kind of the origin of these things. So the fact that they work that way means that you can, in the same sense, as opposed to choosing the regular beam tool, if I need to create sort of my own little custom component, I can do something called modeling in place. And if I model in place, I can create things that have their own funny shape to them. And let me kind of show you what, how that works. You choose what type of element you want. So if it's going to beam, it'll be a structural framing element. That's so that it'll show up with the columns and, you know, or, or yeah, that's what, yeah, it'll show up with the beams as opposed to structural columns, which will be treated as columns instead. I can choose that. I'm going to call this my curvy beam. And here's how you can define something like that. What we're ultimately going to do is do something called a sweep. Okay, we can do it as an extrusion too. A sweep will actually let us, no, this will, we should do it as a sweep. A sweep will follow a path. And let me show you how it works. Sweeps look like this. If I choose sweep, we get to define two different things. It's a path for the sweep, okay? And then it's basically a profile to take along that path. So how that works is I can sketch a path. For example, I can uh, come up with some arc that looks like this. Okay, now let me kind of pop that into 3D so you can sort of see what that looks like. So I just drew an arc that's lying down on the floor. That little thing you're looking at right there is actually a little bit of a work plane. So anything we sketch along that plane will be then extruded or swept along that path. Okay, so how does this work relative to structural elements? Let me go ahead and uh, 
I think which mode I'm in right now. I'm sketching the path still. Okay, let me close that up. And the next thing I want to do is actually figure out what the profile is, the profile that I want to sweep along there. So it can be a rectangular profile, it can be a W section profile, it can be a tube profile, whatever you need. What you got to do is as follows. You go through and you can say that you want to load a profile, and we can go out and grab our profiles, and you'll find there's all sorts of structural sections, like if I want a steel section and I want it to be a W section or an L section, whatever it is that I want it to be in there, let me just grab the wide flange sections. And I'll choose, I'm going to just choose a really big profile so you'll be able to see it. I like this 36 by 256. It's a huge thing. Okay, but I've loaded that profile. Uh, what do I got to do here? That's there. That's there. Now hang on. And get myself into a little hole. Let me try it again. Sweep there. Modify sweep. That's okay. Select the profile. There's my W section right there. There it is. Okay. There you can see it's kind of on that path. What happens now is if I click finish edit mode, It'll basically make a big old curved steel section. Okay, so whenever you want to go through and create things that are sort of custom shapes, you get back to thinking about really how you do the 3D geometry. Is it a sweep? Is it a blend? What is it you want to do? And then between those two different things, you can either sweep or blend or create what you like. Now, this is kind of a really cool capability. You can do it. Sweeps, for example, are really good when you have curving things, and we could have a curved column, or we could have a curved beam, whatever you want. Another sort of common condition you may run into is something like this. If you have something like a tapered beam, you have any tapered beams or you've seen things like that, what you want to do with something like that is, again, we'll go through and make a component, place a component. Oops, hang on. I'm actually going to model in place. I'll make this, uh, again, sort of a, just a column or a beam that'll be easier. What I'm going to do is, oh, where am I? In place editor. Back to home. In this case, I'm going to do a blend. No, actually, I'll do a, what's called a swept blend. A swept blend is basically following the path, but also using two different profiles. A blend would be like just two different profiles along a straight path. Yeah, maybe I'll do the first one first. So blend is like this. For the blend, we have a top and we have a bottom sort of thing. Let me go through and now we have a good sweat blend. I like that better in terms of what I want to illustrate. Okay, once again, we'll go through and sketch a path. So go back to the floor plan and I can make it a straight path or make it a curving path or some arbitrary spliny path if I want to. Let me go ahead and complete my path there. Now what I need to do is select the profiles. For my first profile, let me go through and choose. Maybe I'll have that wide flange on um, 8 by 10 at one end. For the second profile, maybe I'll have the wide flange oh, 16 by 26. Okay, but if I choose those two different profiles, let me switch back to 3D so you can actually see what I did. So I got a small one, I think, on that side and a different size one on that size. It's a little bit bigger. When I finish that, actually now I have a tapered beam where it's kind of much smaller on that side versus this side over there. Okay, and again, that's just sort of different things you can do. You can go through and taper columns, you can taper beams, you can do all sorts of different things like that. Yeah, do you have any conditions where you have like big, f yes, Rook? I have a question. If you want to uh, fabricate this, this element, can you extract a specific product out of Revit to give it to the shop? Yes, in fact, that's where so much of the effort's going right now is being able to basically extract this geometry and send it directly to a digital fabrication. Okay. To be honest, I don't know the specific steps along the way. We can find out about that. That's really 
that's where all this digital fabrication is going, is taking these models and going directly to the steel fabricator. But they're using Revit. Well, what they'll do is they'll take it out of Revit as oh, some other file format, whether it's an SAT file or the, you know, you've defined a geometry, so it's really between here and there, we just got to figure out the correct series of handoffs that's going to let us get the geometry from this one to that one. Like for a lot of systems, we sort of end up taking them out of Revit, like SAT files, and bring them into Rhino. It just, sort of, it just varies, or ACIS files. It depends on really what the receiving end is and how many steps we have to go through to get there. But the key now is to sort of take, this is your design intent, how we actually turn that into machine instructions. Yeah. You do not need to do any, any other preparation on this. They can, you can just extract this and give it to the Well, this is, no, this is basically geometry. Yes. Okay, beyond that, you know, the machine instructions to make that happen, you know, are a little bit different. For to do a blend like this, because, you know, a blend typically isn't actually sort of done that way. Curve, we tend to take something and we just sort of curve it. For a blend, we actually tend to sort of manufacture it out of three different pieces and weld them all together and stuff like that. So it really just depends on, it all ultimately comes down to, we can specify geometry, how are they going to manufacture that geometry? That's where it gets really, really interesting. And I think what's happening is we as designers, are, we have to sort of start thinking about how things will get manufactured because designing things that are really fighting the way things get manufactured is sort of counterproductive. You know, we need to think about like designing them in ways that'll actually match the actual production process. Okay. Uh, yes. For the curve beam. Can, yes. Can you curve it between levels, different levels? Yes. Different? It'd be the same sort of thing. It's you know, I did this just on a flat floor, something like that. Let's kind of show. Can you show us how to do it? Sure. Sure. Let's show you how to do that. Let's take, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is, if I want to sort of, instead of be flat on the floor, I want to be kind of up in the air and transitioning that way. Yeah. For example, let's do a beam that you would do like through this barrel arch or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Then I'll show you how to do it as a truss. But let's do the beam first. Okay. What I need to do is, we will take, and here's what I need. I need to sketch a path, and I have paths all over each floor level. So every floor level is a working plane. Vertically, I don't necessarily have so many paths to, or sketching planes to work with. So I need to kind of create a new one for myself, just so I have something to work with. And where I'm going to do that is, under work planes, I can define something as a new reference plane. And I'm going to just sort of draw a line back over here as a reference plane. And what am I doing? I'm really just giving myself a surface to sketch on. So I'm just going to call this sketch curving beam. And that's just the name that I can work with. Because what I want to do now is actually go through and switch to, oh, it might be best to do it from the north elevation so I can look at it from the top. And I want to draw, but I want to draw on that plane. So what I need to do is basically set the work plane now to, and since I gave it a name, I'll find it, that work plane, sketch that, and I can even show it so you can sort of see where it is. Well, I think I could show it. Hmm. I'm not going to worry about the fact that I'm not seeing it. Let's just start drawing it. Okay, I will say in the same sense as what I did before, I'm going to make a new component in place. I'm going to make a piece of framing. Call it vertical curve. We're going to do that same sort of sweeping if I want to. In this case, my sweep is going to be sort of a very regular shape. I can go through and just do an arc like this and oh, that's an, oh, I know what it is. It's um, it's where the cutting plane is right now. I'm not seeing things because the sketching plane is behind the cutting plane where I'm looking at right now. That's kind of okay. We'll leave that be for now. Just in the interest of time. And then let me finish that path. Then I'll go through and choose the profile again. For the profile, I will choose, oh, like the 16 by 26. Say OK. Again, I'm not seeing it because it's kind of behind me now. But if I go to 3D now, you'll actually see it's there. So the only trick to this in terms of working with these different beams and getting it vertically is you always have to create a, a reference plane that you can draw the path on. And if you can do that, then you have the ability to kind of start uh, you know, working with it that way. Okay. okay, does that sort of make sense? Yes, thank you.
No worries. Now let's show you sort of one other way to do this that actually kind of relative to that barrel vault, because I think it's sort of a very good thing for you. That barrel vault's supporting some sort of roof, right? Some sort of roof structure. Okay, let's talk about that. Let me go back to the north elevation, actually the plan view. You can find where that north elevation cutting plane is just so I can move it out. It's right there right now. Let me move it behind so I can see things. Okay, so I'm going to go back to that north elevation. Now I can see the reference plane. Okay, if I want to create sort of that roof, that roof which is sort of the barrel vault shape, that's classically, as opposed to being a roof by footprint, that'd be a roof by extrusion, where you have a kind of barrel shape and you're going to extrude it back into the plane. So let me do that first, just so we have something to work with. I'm going to say uh, home. I will say, oh, actually it's under architect now. Roof by extrusion. How does roof by extrusion work? Roof by extrusion just says, let's draw a profile. So example, I'll sort of draw a profile on the work plane. Okay. And then what I'll do is choose the type of roof, whether it's a generic roof, if I'm looking at a low level of detail. If I'm working to a higher level of detail, I could choose a sort of more specific roof assembly. But let's choose just a generic roof. I'll say finish. Okay, and what it's done is it's created just an extrusion, which is that roof shape. I'm just going to show you there. Let's see if I can find it. Is it that one? No, hang on. Uh, I don't think I'm looking at the roofs. There's always a reason why you're not seeing things. There it is. So here's that extruded roof. Now here's the deal. You would like to go ahead and put some trusses under that roof to kind of support that barrel roof. I think that's what you're after. So let's talk about how you do that. Let me rotate it around a little bit. In the structural tools, one of the ones that is really cool and got infinitely better like two releases ago is the truss tool, because here's how it works. I can take the truss tool and choose the truss, okay, and then I can choose the type of truss I want, like oh, like a how truss. Let me go ahead and load up some other one. And under structural, let's see what we got for trusses. Got gable trusses, maybe something like that. Scissors truss, a flat truss. I'll do it as a flat truss for now. Actually, I think that's the one that's already in there. Okay. But let's show you what it actually looks like. If I want to go through and draw that truss, I'll say again under home and truss, what level to put it on, and I'll put it on level two. That's fine for now. Maybe on level three. You got to think of where I am in vertically in, in space. And I'll just sort of draw from here across to there. Okay, and the truss will just sort of stretch itself to match that shape. If I come back in 3D to a front-on view, there you'll see it. A little ugly right now because it's made up of gigantic elements. What are the cords made out of? I'll figure this out in a second. It's somewhere in here. Some standard type. Uh, we need to do that, but I can make it smaller. But here's what you got to do. If you got a truss like this, you got a flat truss, you got a round roof. Okay. Remember that thing about taking walls and attaching them to roofs and how good that was? Hmm. Yeah, I got you thinking for a minute there. Take this. Let's see if I can find it in here because it's here somewhere. Modify. Attach top or bottom. If I choose that. Did a little bit of strangeness in terms of what's going on because that sort of has an awful lot of members relative to the size of it. But what it will do is it will take the top cord of the truss and make it actually match that. So it really kind of gets to sort of what does your actual truss system look like? Do you want it to be you know, like a, a flat lower cord and a curving upper cord? Both? In that case, what we want to do, kind of in the same sense, is I'd actually want to make a lower surface and attach it to the lower surface and then sort of take out the lower surface after I attach it or hide it. Because okay. we're going to need sort of an outer shell, then the inner shell, which is kind of the virtual plane that you don't really want to have there. But if you do it that way, in the same sense, you can say, take this thing and at the bottom here, under modify, you can attach the bottom instead. Okay, and attach it to a different surface. But that's really, if you've got one of these like undulating free-form roofs, 
Don't think about having to place every beam and slant it and slope it all individually. Put big trusses in or space frames and just attach the top and the bottom and it'll sort of follow the curve for you pretty good. Does that make sense? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. There's other things with structural stuff. Actually, let me kind of like, just relative to what you guys want to do right now, because there's about 15 minutes left in class. Let's think about this. Because I could talk ever so briefly about some of the uh, ductwork stuff in the MEP, or we could keep on going with structural. So just, what, what do you prefer? Structural, I think. Structural. Just keep going with that. We can do this in the MEP later. So let's have about this. Because we can keep on talking about a lot of structural things. Why don't you just ask some questions about things you want to see, and I'll do my best to try and like answer them, because I think... Ah, rebar is very tricky. I am not the best in terms of what's going on with rebar and stuff like that, but for these concrete columns, there's a whole set of tools for doing that, and I wish I could actually give you better answers for this. But for all this stuff, you know, there is some notion about really what the, the rebar cover distance is and all that type of stuff, but let me see if I can even find it in here. There's a whole funny little reinforcement tab and I wish I knew more about using it because this is where you actually start drawing that stuff. So, if, for example, if I... Let me go to like a floor plan level and see if we can make any sense out of it. There's a rebar tool. So we have all these things about different shapes and what the spacing is. Is it a hook? Is it a whatever? And I can... You know, I'm just going to point you in that direction. I can actually bone up on this a little bit and learn more so I can give you some help like, uh, like when we're doing it remotely next week. But this is one that I know it's there. People who are very good at it are fantastic about doing this, but this is just not... Uh, I, I don't know enough about it, but that's where I'd go looking. Okay, so, yeah. I won't, I won't try and fluff you through that one because you know, I'll run into a wall really quickly. I won't, I, won't, I won't shine you on. Okay, other things you're coming into with structures? So this barrel vault roof truss seems to be like one of the issues for you. How about the rest of the structures? Is there anything else that's kind of like a little bit odd? How, how you on foundations? You want to see anything with the foundations? Are you pretty good on that in terms of putting isolated footings under things? or? Well, structural foundations. What? Structural penetration? I'm not sure. I mean, like you said, the classic, uh, you know, ductwork through uh, formating it. Oh, that's kind of an interesting one in terms of doing stuff like that. Because it's, yeah. Hmm. I guess it may not be necessary in the structural model. It's funny. I've never actually sort of seen the modeled in. Virtually, have you ever seen anything like that? Because it's really, I know that. You know, up to a certain size, like even with pipe work, they will model it, but they don't model every last penetration and hole going through things. But in terms of what I've seen, I haven't seen people putting in a lot of like penetrations. It's really more like they just handle it on the net, on the coordination side to say that that's a known clash, but it's an okay clash. I'm just, I'm just trying to think. I haven't really seen a whole lot with that. I guess maybe not on the design side, but I would imagine that structural shop would have to would have to account for them. Oh, exactly. Right? Exactly. So what will happen is, and that's sort of a good thing because these are our design models. You know, we'll take the BIM model and the linked uh, ductwork model, and then there will ultimately be final fabrication models that are sort of derivatives of these two different models. We will finally go through and put that stuff in there to get it manufactured in there. But typically, we don't do it at this level. Yeah, good question though. That is really, that's kind of the gist of, there's, there's a whole group of people we're trying to work on how we can take the design models all the way from conceptual all the way through like the fabrication and where the hitches are along the way and, you know, what is it? That's one of those ones people are working on it. There will probably be a good answer within three or four years, but it's still on the edge of really... Uh, you reuse tech one? Because I understand that it can actually, people have taken it to level work. You can issue structural shop launch, Sure. In fact, um, Monday night, I was working with uh, some folks who were working with Tecla on this whole high-def BIM sort of idea. And we were really playing a whole game about how to get the Tecla drawings and the Revit drawings working together. And they're actually using it on that sort of workflow on, there's a new school of cinema. There's a new building on campus. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We are using that process there. They were running into some difficulties in terms of trying to get the Tecla and the Revit models talking together. But you know, for that really detailed level of structural modeling, Tecla is really better. At this point, yeah, I, I would definitely sort of give it to that. Yeah, so, yeah, and part of the whole workflow with all this stuff is really, and this is sort of a good overall high-level point for this course, is that although you know, I tend to talk about things in terms of Revit and the Autodesk tools, because that's sort of my world where I come from, 
on integrated project teams, you know, everyone has their own tool that is best for their own part of the process. And really where this gets more interesting than anything is really how we get the data from all those things together into these coordination models so that you can work in Tecla, I can work in Revit for my architecture, and we can still go ahead and have a meaningful conversation. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's not very fruitful for me to say, oh, no, you have to work in Revit. Because that's like a, you know, that's, that's unrealistic. You should work in the tool that's best for you. And we're all working towards standard data change in formats that uh, can let us kind of communicate between all the different tools. So, yeah, that's kind of the forefront. That's, that's our research. That's, you know, how to make that kind of stuff flow nicely. That's, you know, or that may be your research if you stick around and do stuff like that. Yes? Actually, I was on a field trip for another class this past Saturday. Uh -huh. And we walked a job on, at UCLA. And they used uh, Navisworks to pull in uh, different all the, the all the different MVP from different contractors who used whichever program they wanted to use. Yep. And they had modeled it down to uh, I don't know if they did specific holes for actual pipe penetrations, but they identified areas where they were going to have to not run the the wall above the ceiling, like not run that all the way up to the roof, drop it, and in certain areas where they're higher volume. And they, they had a, a rough idea of what was what they're going to have to change. Um, he said the as builds may not match it exactly, but it identified the areas of where they're going to have heavy traffic and where they need to adjust structures. It's fantastic. And really, what you're going to learn is that right now, Navisworks is kind of the, the Swiss Army knife of, like, it, it pulls in files from so many different formats. And it's really a very good tool for coordinating and finding the clashes. It's actually, it's a funny tool because it does 4D simulation, it does uh, rendering, it does uh, clash detection, it does a bunch of different things, like simultaneously, but really it's strength, and what everyone's doing in those BIM caves is using Navisworks to go through and work out these clashes with teams of designers so that we can identify where the clash is and then work together to figure out how we're gonna resolve it. Is it my problem, is it your problem, or you know, which part of the design is gonna give to make room for that? And really, even as you go through and do these, you know, as you're modeling an existing building, a lot of this has been worked out. But so much of what we run into is, you know, I'm putting the structure in place, optimizing for my structural things. So I'm putting in very deep sections and few of them. You know, however, I'm consuming all the space that you want to run your ductwork through. And that's really where we are right now in terms of doing this coordination. It's that we can, we can get the data together, but it's really, once we figure out there is a clash, you know, how do we manage that and track that and negotiate about really what is the optimum solution? Because there's, there's trade-offs to all those things. You know, cheaper structure, but very expensive mechanical that's going to perform badly. You know, better performing mechanical, but the structure may be more. Really, what's worthwhile over the next 50-year life of the building for the owner? You know, because... Yeah, you know, we could solve the problem nicely for myself for the next two years, but I may be creating a very big problem for the owner over the next 50 years. And that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of where this is all coming to. BIM is really giving us the ability to look and understand holistically what the impacts of our design decisions are. Yeah, then what do we do with that? Yeah, but at least now we have the information and we could actually make a decision. And then we have to go through and make the decision and get the organization and the, the people to cooperate with it. Yeah. Should I chime in, Birchin? Because it's really, it's, this, is, this, this is really cool stuff that you're even talking about this stuff. Yeah. Um, we are a little bit running out of time. So sure. that's my worry. Before we lose you, I uh, just wanted to ask if there are any specific structure or related yeah. questions. Because it seems like you guys are working on your models. Yeah. So are you, yeah, because really... And then we can continue the discussion. Exactly, that, that discussion will keep since, going. Since you're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, so yeah, any last little structural issues? And I know maybe you just haven't modeled the structure in enough detail yet where you've run into all the issues yet. Rebar, we got to get back to... I owe you a lot on that, but... Uh, the structural garland sparks. Oh. Ah. <laughs> that happens. Well, what's going to happen? So, so what, I'm scheduled to come back next week. Yes. Or actually, I'm going to be remote next yes, week. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But so we'll if the, we will send an announcement. If there are any questions from the structural members of the teams, then maybe we should start the class with that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, how do you do something like that? Yeah. Let's just show. It's easy. It. Oh, it's so easy. Let's just kind of show you. Yeah. Okay, at least get you started in the right direction. I'm going to go back to the 3D view. There's really like a, you know, what, a couple classic ways of sort of doing the foundation elements. So let's take a look at them in here. 
Um, slabs, we sort of get that. You go through and put a slab down. The big thing about slab is go through and draw the slab. That part's good. You're all pretty fine on that. The thing that gives everyone sort of an interesting sort of little variation on slabs is often you have the thickened edges and you have to worry about that. And you handle that all through slab edges. And we can put different profiles on there, but we can just sort of draw in a slab edge. And what it'll do is it'll put that thickening around there, around the sizes. So that takes care of most of what you want. If you have sort of a different sort of toe condition on these things, okay, you can edit the profile itself. And we can sort of choose different sizes and whatever's going on there. So slabs, are they, they, they tend to work out pretty easily. Over here on our building, where did my building go? There it is. Okay. If I want to go through and put some little spread footings, little isolated footings under those columns, it is, again, under uh, isolated. Okay. We can go through and put them at column locations. We can place them kind of in floor plan views, but it's pretty much you have these different types of footing conditions. So, and or isolated footings, different sizes. If you have something that you need that's a little bit different, you can duplicate the size and say that, oh, no, no, I need a, uh, a 72 inch by 72 inch by 36 inch one, whatever it is you need there. Adjust the parameters here. Those would be big. Okay, say okay. There's my big old block. If I put by columns, I can choose that column, choose that column. I have to control click to get them all. Control click. Those are a little blocky. Say finish and you'll put them under there. The nice thing about these is if you have these sort of things and you also go through and put a slab in there, Come back over there. There's those little guys down there. Oh, let's put in a couple that are sort of not quite the same size. I'll put some isolated ones in. I'll choose uh, not so square size. If I put them over there and I do the space bar, I can sort of rotate it through the different orientations. That's kind of like what happens with those columns. We talked about the rectangular columns and where they follow. So I can put them in there or rotate them. Oh, even to your question too, if they're radial like this, I can have them rotate and it'll follow the radial distance. Kind of follow the axis. It'll try and follow the axes. Okay, so once you put those in there, if you go through and put a slab on top of it, let's come back on over. Let me draw my slab. The nice thing is they will actually sort of munge themselves together. They will merge together if you want them to. Looking a little green in there. Right now it's like it's either two different heights. What's going on there? That's the edge of the analytical model and stuff like that. But if they're the same material, if the material on this is cast in place concrete, which I imagine it is, and the material on that is also cast in place concrete, Oh, there it is, putting material on there. If I cut my sections now, those will sort of merge themselves together and kind of look good. The final sort of foundation you want to know about is sort of the wall foundation, or like it's a, a, like a found, uh, like either a footing under like a foundation wall. If I have like a wall of some type, this could be like a retaining wall, or it could be sort of a, just a little footing wall underneath things, and I want to go through and put a strip footing underneath it, it's the wall foundation. You can choose a thickness, a depth, all those sort of things. And all you do is you choose the wall, and it'll put it under there. Okay. Actually, a really cool thing, I was playing around with this with some people on a hillside site the other day, is as follows. If the wall does something a little bit different, for example, this wall steps up because you're on a hillside site, okay. the footing will jump automatically with it. Okay, so it's kind of cool in terms of being able to do stuff like that. So that'll take care of those are your, your three big primary footing conditions. A strip under a wall, an isolated footing under like point load, or a whole slab that can be very thick if you have a big floating foundation. And you just want to spread the loads very broadly across a larger area area. Oh, and then even within this, see if I can find it in here. Let me load from families. Insert. 
If you need, let's see if I can find these foundations, pile caps. So if you have not only just sort of a footing, but you actually have something where it's a pile cap and you want to put a lot of piles under them or something like that, those are in there too. And that'll include, you know, all the little elements under there. And then you can go through and customize, you know, what the depth of all that is and what the thickness and what's happening with the piles and stuff like that to get on down to the, the bedrock, whether friction or bearing, whatever. Yeah, so... It's all kind of in there. The cool thing, the one thing we didn't even talk about here and we won't talk about today, but I'll sort of allude to, because we can show it a little bit if anyone wants to. In fact, I can set up a separate session online if anyone wants to see it. You can take all these models. If you model it nicely, they're really analytically you know, enabled too in that. One thing we haven't talked about all within Revit structure is there's a whole analyze tab where we can put on loads. We can start thinking about the endpoint conditions and really export this model directly to eTabs or SAP or Robot Structure. There's a bunch of different software programs we can that will take your model elements, take the loads, do the analysis, resize things appropriately as necessary, and then you can round trip it back into Revit and any changes you make over here will change the model. So we don't have to have two separate models and have a lot of transcription. You know, just the structural engineer, the structural designer, and the architect could all be working on the same models that are fully linked. And changes percolate back and forth. Yes? You can even model the degree of freedom for, for all the joints. And yes. For each of the different like columns and stuff like that, for all you structures fans. Let's look at it there. Hang on. Top connection, end connection. It's whether it's moment or shear, but also, let me see if I can find where the other choice is in here. Top connection, enable analytical. I'm thinking about why this is not showing. Hang on, let me try on the beam connection. Center of gravity, end elevation. There's basically the choice of really what the connection type is. And I'm just not finding it right now. Cantilever, moment frame. But it actually, you know, there's, there's a place if I find it, I will, where we go through and, hmm, let's not find it right now. You can actually specify which degree of freedom. Is it X? Is it Y? Is it Z? So sort of both movement as well as rotation. So you can control all six different degrees. To, to analysis, you know, like SAP, it can detect all these. these exactly. So they've worked out a common interchange format so that if you specify it here, it can go over there and vice versa if the engineer sort of specifies it there. So really, in fact, we didn't even talk about the whole issue of lateral framing versus moment frames and stuff like that. On my little steel structure here, if I want this sort of thing to be a moment frame to do the lateral support, I can choose those guys and see if I can find it in, oh, there's the whole, what did I actually choose there? Let's get the beam. There's a whole thing about whether it was pinned or not at the top. In here is the whole thing about is it a moment frame or not? I'm going to think about why I'm not actually seeing all those things right now because it was just there a second ago. But it's uh, you can choose whether it's a moment frame or not. If you, on the other hand, don't want to do moment frames, which tend to be an expensive way of doing it and stuff like that, if you're just looking for sort of more of a lateral bracing scheme, you can choose, again, something that you want in here to use, like a hollow steel section or something like that. And just kind of uh, bring up some lateral framing or something like that. Okay, and again, we're not just sort of putting it in there architecturally and looking at the conflicts. That's going to be understood in an analytical sense. So when we do the lateral analysis, we can size that stuff too. Actually, the other one, oh, shear cores, structural walls, shear cores, it'll handle that too. Yes? Is it possible to show base plates? That is not so good at in terms of doing that. No, it definitely, there's this whole funny thing where, yeah, you know, it's again, it's a level of detail thing. Yeah, you would like to show the plates and the bolting and all that type of stuff. And it's not very good at doing that. They still sort of, yeah, you know, say, oh, that's this funny level where you're off doing more 2D detailing or something like that. So we tend not to model it. It could be because we could create a family, okay, which is a base plate and the bolts and the whole nine yards and put them all in there and have a very detailed accounting. Actually, what I think is going to happen is the tools get better, and we start actually using the model to do a detailed takeoff and a detailed fabrication. We'll start modeling in that level of detail, but we haven't quite pushed to that yet, so people aren't doing it. I don't commonly see that. Same thing with the structural penetrations. 
we'll get to that point. I just don't think we've pushed it quite to that point yet. Yeah. Super. Shall we adjourn for today? Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Okay, so we will see you all via the internet next week. Yes. And if things come up between now and then, please just send questions. And we will uh, do our best to answer them and get you answers. About